So with that, let me turn it over to Jason. Perfect. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. I appreciate that, Lisa. How many golfers do I have in the room? How many people struggle with the perfect game? All right, so do I. Uh, absolutely insidious. How many people have heard the expression, uh, driving is for show, putting is for dough? Yeah, absolutely. But of course, what do we do? We go out and buy the biggest, baddest driver we can find, spend all the money on that, and then shake it in the woods anyway. Yeah. In business, top line sales are for show. Profit is for dough. Yet many of us are still stuck in that mindset about top line sales. I mean, really, when you go to a convention, what do we hear all the time? My sales are this, my sales are that. And we get, that's all we hear. That's all we talk about. How many times have you ever heard anybody say, oh, my net profit did this? No, it's like a foreign concept. We don't talk about that at all. Well, let me tell you right now, top line sales of the show, net profit. That's what we got to get down to. And that's where we have to change our mindset away from that top line sales mentality. Now, as distributors, we spend an awful lot of money on, you know, on the uh, customer service aspect, if you will. The, the problem is that when we're trying to find net profit, we're trying to look for net profit in our organizations, we haven't done a really good job teaching other people how to hunt for cash inside of our organizations, have we? I mean, maybe I'd say in this room, most of you have a good concept of you know, sales, the relationship to sales, gross profit and maybe down to net profit, but think about who the net profit decision makers are in your organization. <clears throat> Is it the finance people? No, who else makes good net profit decisions in your distribution organization? Okay, this is the audience participation portion of this uh, presentation. Who else makes those decisions? Who really makes that call? Purchasing, yeah, customer service, sure. Who else? Do you think anybody in your warehouse makes a net profit decision? Each and every day. Can a driver make a net, a net profit decision for your company? Oh, you bet they can. Absolutely. Yeah. But do we ever talk about net profit with these, the, uh, these folks? We never do. We never invite them in on the cash hunting game because we haven't educated them. We haven't told them how money works inside of the organization. Now, yes, you could put up a spreadsheet and you could say, okay, here's a, you know, here's a p and or here's a income statement for the month, and you could walk them down through and some official looking individual gets up there and does it. How long do you think it's going to take before their eyes glaze over and they kind of roll back and say, I don't know what you're talking about, but boy, it looks good. Just like that. They'll be lost on that. Because most people in your organization are not trained to, to read financials. I find them horribly boring. I've been doing it a long time. I don't like them. So why would these folks want to get up there? I mean, really, would they going to look up there and say, oh, okay, and uh, how much do I get paid? Yeah, because they don't understand what they're looking at. Yet they are the biggest influencers of that content. So I want to walk you through a little exercise to maybe help you educate the people who work with you and for you how to understand how money goes through the organization and how we can drive ourselves down to net profit. So in order to do this, I'm looking for a volunteer. Now, this volunteer has the opportunity, um, well, I'd like them to make an investment in our education today. Now, when you make an investment, generally, what do you expect? <clears throat> a return on that investment, sure. Absolutely, I think that's only fair. Tell you what, I'm giving you the opportunity to get 100% return on your investment. But I am also giving you the opportunity to get a 0% return on your investment. Kind of sounds like what we do each and every day in distribution, doesn't it? Yeah. Who's interested in investing? How about a buck? Yeah? All right. Now, don't take credit cards, you know. Just, I mean, I'm looking for a real dollar here. Look at that. Oh. Thank you. Appreciate it, Gene. So. Walk through the income statement of a typical wholesale distributor. We sell something for a buck. And let's say that it was a very, very good day and we paid 60 cents for it. 
How much did we make? Trust me, the tougher math gets the <laughs> yeah. tougher. Let's go with the easy, easy math. 40 cents. All right, let's go with 40 cents. All right. I'm sorry, to mean it's slightly painful. It would have been more painful if it was a bigger denomination. And by the way, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a magician. That is not going to come uh, back. <laughs> Call this. That's actually felony. What do we call this? <laughs> gross profit, gross margin. Oh, God, I get in such arguments with people about what they want to call. It. I'm like tomato, tomato. I don't, I don't really care one way or the other. What you call it? This is your profit or gross profit, gross margin. Now, does the owner of the organization get to put this into their back pocket at the end of each and every month? Would that be awesome? That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? I think we can all agree, no, that does not happen. In fact, we had 20-year employees. I grew up in distribution. We had 20-year employees who worked for my family and uh, that thought that my dad would actually pocket that gross profit each and every month. God, that would have been great. But clearly not going to happen. What happens to this before it becomes net profit? Overhead. overhead. Tell me, what are some of the things that make up overhead? What are some of the big ones? Salary. Salary is a big one. Yeah. Okay. Insurances. All kinds of them. We got health insurance. Yeah, that one's going down. Health insurance. General liability insurance. What other things do we got here? Taxes. Taxes. All right. Take a big one out of there. Okay. What else? Rent. Rent. Yeah, let's go for the simple. Rent. <coughs> Utilities. Sure. What else comes to mind? Absolutely, most of us finance uh, the products that we have in our warehouse. That's fair. What else? Anything else come to mind? Marketing. Marketing, sure. Can we get some of those miscellaneous sales expenses? <laughs> <laughs> before you all run out of any money here, um, I, I gotta try to get some consulting fees out here or something like that. So. <laughs> Yeah, think about professional services. You've got accountants, attorneys, you know, all kinds of professional services that help you with your business. Does that cost money? Absolutely. How many of you uh, deliver your own products? Delivery, please. All right. So fuel expenses, freight expenses, a huge piece of what is coming out of here. What else comes to mind? come out of this before it becomes net profit? Got all the apps, got utilities, yeah. got the taxes. We are standing here in the mecca of what I'm speaking of. IT. IT and technology, yeah. We didn't have IT departments before, did we? Now, what has happened to the price of hardware over the last several years? It's gone down, hasn't it? Yeah, it's gone cheaper. So there's this myth that technology is getting cheap in our, cheaper in our organizations, right? No. Now, the physical things, yeah, absolutely. Where we just had a computer on our desk, now we've got tablets, we've got our phones, all of these things. And we have now IT departments. And it's not just one person in, anymore. Now it's two. And we have professional services that come and assist this. So this is a big piece of that budget as well. A lot of money coming out of it. So generally, and, and there's many more, many, many more expenses we could go through. But generally, this is what net profit looks like in most wholesale distribution companies. We work 365 days a year. Act. <coughs> scary, isn't it? What if that goes to zero or less than zero? Is that just a bad day for the owner of the organization? Who else is affected when that happens? Suppliers and Everybody gets a piece. How? What are some of the things that happen? What are some of the negatives? Especially to the employees. Again, your net profit decision makers. That's right. Might lop off a few heads, too. Sometimes we have to do that. It's not fun, but it happens. Anything else come to mind? What else changes? Maybe for those of you who have delivery vehicles, you know, it stays on the road an extra year, and then all of a sudden you have a driver sitting inside the road calling AAA. Less inventory. Less inventory. You can't invest in the greatest things in sliced bread when your supplier says, 
Look what we've got. I don't have any money for it. Yeah, we can't just go to the ATM anymore. You know, sometimes our line of credit's tapped down. Yeah, when we're down to zero or less than zero, bad things happen in the organization. It makes it difficult for us to progress. We start missing software updates. We, we stay on older technology. Yeah, a lot of bad things happen. Now, what if we were able to add maybe a percent back here? One or two percent. Does the owner of the company, is that the only winner in this? The owner of the company? The net profit improves? No. Who else wins? Sure. How do they win? Raises. Raises. Benefits. I'll tell you right now, one of the greatest things about working in, in wholesale distribution, I, I work exclusively in wholesale distribution, privately held wholesale distribution, by the way. And the people that own these organizations, generally family businesses, they will bend over backwards to take care of the people who are living in Florida. Any windfall tends to get spread amongst all the people in the organization. So when we find a little bit more here in that profit, who do you think wins in that deal? Everyone. That's the message that we have to bring back. We have to teach people how to hunt for cash and to really appreciate what net profit looks like and why we want to drive net profit in these organizations. Yeah, that's how we win. And that's how we make significant changes in our organization. <coughs> Briefly, just looking at the traditional supply chain, the world distributors live in is generally right here, between manufacturing and the customer. We live right this little piece here. Why wouldn't manufacturers go direct to the customer? I, I do know there is a little bit of jumping in the chain, but why shouldn't it, why shouldn't manufacturers go directly? Cost of service too high. Cost of service too high? Okay. Okay. Help me with that with that concept. Sales reps for the Good, good. So we provide technical expertise into the market space. <clears throat> we train our employees. Good. Okay. That's a service that we actually provide both sides of the chain. Yeah, up and down. What else? What other services? How do we justify the money we take out of the chain? Very Help me out with this one. I like small work. Large friend. quantities of bring it down. So yeah. well, well, big stuff. Right, exactly, we meter it in for them. Yeah, we don't force them to take the container anymore. You know, we'll give them bite-sized pieces. And we localize that, don't we? We don't force them to go long distances to get their products. <clears throat> what else do we do for them? Why else do, how do we justify our existence? Frankly, if we forget this, folks, we're out of the game. <laughs> We've got to remember why we are here. We spread costs. One stop shop? Sure. What else? Selling smaller quantities. Selling some bite sized pieces. Yeah. Like that. Buy technical support, sometimes service uh, product warranty support on product, <coughs> sometimes we provide bid assistance. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that we do. Keep customers. Keep customers. Keep customers. Okay. Basically, it's marketing, and, and actually, one of the other you know valuable things that we add to the market is we are the eyes in the field. Mm -hmm. and we provide responses back to that manufacturing community. What do we do for the customer? There's one big one that we haven't mentioned yet. Service. What's that? Service. Service. Now, this is all under the auspice of services. I mean, we <laughs> customer service is really a big, broad thing, and I'd like to break it down into some. There's one, do we make people pay for things immediately when they come pick it up from us? We are a bank. Now, let me tell you something. We have very liberal credit policies in this world. Trust me, if our credit policies were the same as our, our banking friends in the banking community, the entire supply chain would come to a And I think you'll agree with me. It's that liberal credit policy out there that allows you know, the supply chain to be lubricated. We don't want to get taken advantage of. You know? 
So we, we do provide a few services, don't we? And that's really what happens. You saw me tearing up the dollar. Everything we do is in the name of customer service. That's where all that money is spent. In fact, I don't think there's anyone in your organization that you could not tie to the words customer service. Because that's what we do, Mr. Bishop. You don't make sense. You don't invent it. You just distribute it. You just service. It has value to it. Makes sense to everybody. Yeah. Keep that in our mind. So, I guess my bigger question is, do all the customers actually deserve this? Are all customers created equal? No? What do we tell our people though? What do we tell our inside sales and our customer service people? How should we treat everyone? Equal, right. We tell them that they're all equal, yet in the back of our minds, like, no, they're not all equal. And in fact, in their mind, no, they're not equal. In fact, it's a really good exercise. Go back to your team. Gather them up together. Say, all right, give me a list of our top 10 customers. Just have them right down, top to bottom. How do you think they're going to rank that list? By sales volume, <clears throat> right. Then a week later, I want you to go back to the same team. Just gather them up again and say, okay, give me a list of our top 10 most profitable customers. Now, did I ask them the same thing? Do you think in many of their minds that I just asked the exact same thing? Absolutely. There is this notion that our largest customers are our most profitable customers, but I think we can agree <coughs> absolutely not the case. In fact, when we're looking at customers, sometimes our largest customers are our least profitable customers. Could you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. So again, do they all deserve the premier services that we give? Probably not. How do we differentiate? How do we figure out who deserves and who does not? Is it just a popularity contest? Let me tell you right now that your employees, you know, that your customer service people probably have a list of people that they should not be serving any longer. They probably have this wonderful list saying, I'm done with those folks. So they know who are your, your most important customers or your most profitable customers are in the back of their heads. They just haven't learned to articulate it yet. So I want to offer a little solution, a technology solution, if you will, about how do we look at our most profitable customers? Again, most of us will rank based on volume. But again, didn't I say at the very, very beginning, top line sales, volume is for show. Net profit is for show. <coughs> Does anybody run a customer profitability analysis like this? I'm trying to drive down to your, you know, how'd it go? Great. Yeah? Painful at first though, right? <coughs> That's why I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> again, painful again. Yeah, generally I like to tell people this is the Jack Daniels or Mayox report. Because you better have one of those next to you the first time you run this report. Some names are going to get down at the bottom of you and go, ooh, that ain't good. Let's walk through how it works. Definitely, you definitely want to have someone who has done business with you for a full 12 months, at least, in order to put them against this scrutiny. All brand new customers are darlings until they prove themselves otherwise. So just your customers have been with you for a full year. So pretty simple report. May, annual sale, or 12 month sales volume, cost of goods sold, gross margin, number of orders that you processed for that person in the last 12 months. And then something called the COPO. What is that? Cost of processing orders. Cost of process, good, because most people say cost of PO. Good, well done, nailed it the first time. Yeah, cost of processing an order. What does it cost me to pick, pack, ship, deliver, and get paid for this thing? All of those things. Getting paid, by the way, is a really important thing. So when you did this, roughly how much was your cost to serve or cost process? Uh, if you don't mind sharing. If it's a state secret, then I'll I'm okay. Well, I think we recalculated it twice a year. In the 60s, okay, that, that's generally what I would find. Most hard goods distributors are somewhere between 40 and 80, you know, right there. 
60 is fair. I was 56 bucks when I ran it for myself. Uh, now, if you do run this and it's 110, 120, don't freak out. That's what that's the right number for your company. I have clients that have two hundred dollar in order of cost to serve. So don't freak out if it's something greater than the sixty or anything that we've talked about here today. Your number is personal. Now, can you work on it? Absolutely. You can improve that over time. But uh, yeah, don't freak out if it's that. Now, many of you might be asking, okay, so how do I come up with that? A couple different ways to do it. There is the hard way. I'm not a fan of, but I will explain it to you very briefly if I can. It's using uh, activity-based costing software or an activity-based costing methodology. And to make it really easy to understand, activity-based costing is just walking yourself through an order and affixing a, a cost to each person who touches that order. So visualize, if you will, take a, uh, a big black uh, garbage bag, cut a hole for your head, put it on, and you walk around through your organization just like you're in order. Anyone who interacts with you, put a little post-it note on it, with their name on it, and how long they spent with you. And then at the end of the, uh, the process, you add up all the people who you spent time with, and you try to come up with a number, and trust me, there's a lot of fighting that goes on. <coughs> it's exhaustive. And frankly, I don't think it really does a whole lot for you. Here's the quick, dirty method. Annual operating expenses divided by the number of orders you processed. Is that the method you used? But you go with the, the mean, ugly, uh, activity-based concept. We use lines. Okay. Oh, okay. That works, too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, what I use is uh, you can use invoices, you can use orders, but really, annual operating expenses, as I said earlier, everybody's in the customer service game, aren't they, in your organization? You cannot show me one individual in your company that is not in the customer service world. Annual operating expenses divided by the number of orders processed, number of lines processed, number of invoices, whatever it is, that's cool. Just come down to a number that you can benchmark off of. Take that cost processing order, multiply it by the number of orders that you process for that particular organization, and you come up with something called the product, or what did it cost you to serve this organization over the last 12 months? Well, they gave you $2,000 to work with, cost you $400, so you made a net profit of $1,600 over the course of 12 months with this customer. Everybody tracking with me on this thing? Okay. Relatively simple information to extract, relatively simple data to extract uh, from your uh, in, uh, from your uh, systems, then I would like you to rank this report by contribution to net profit. Top 1,600 down to negative 900. So you get this ranking here, and eventually you're going to have some positives, positive, positive, positives, and then you'll hit zero, and then you're going to go negative a little bit. What percentage of your customers do you think are going to be on the positive side? I'm not going to throw anything at you, I just like, yes. <clears throat> okay, you're killing me here. What percent do you think are going to be above zero? 90% above? That would be an awesome day. That would be nice. That would be nice, yes. In most companies I've worked with, it's been roughly 20, 20%. Yes, the, uh, the Pareto principle, the 80 20 rule. Yep. Generally, it's a little better than that. I do have a, a, a medical uh, a company that it was 19 above, you know, uh, 81 below. But generally speaking, I find that it's 30% are profitable, 70% below, which still doesn't make you feel very good, does it? Jack Daniels, Maalox, whatever your poison is, you know, help yourself through this situation. It's not a good feeling when this happens for the first time. You're like, uh oh, this ain't good. 70% of the time I'm doing transactions, I am losing money. I don't like this at all. So what is our solution here? <clears throat> Should we just uh, take out the broadsword and just lop off all the heads of these people? Maybe a great organization, you know, we can just service this top 20, 25%. Be good, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, we would probably go out of business doing that. Be fine, but we would go out of business pretty quickly. 
generally what I will do when I get a report like this is I'll start walking down through the negatives, you know, getting more upset, more upset, more upset. Eventually, the two remedies I talked about earlier are not going to be working, and you have to find your threshold of pain. Generally, I find it's about 20% from the bottom. That's about my threshold of pain. That's when I'm like, you know, I'm done with this. I have got to change the way I'm doing business. By the way, to these folks here, and this is a large swath of people, yes, they are technically uh, unprofitable, but do they provide something for us? What do they provide? Cash flow. Cash flow? Okay. Okay. They also allow us one other thing. Anything that <coughs> they didn't know. Yeah. They know it. In fact, some of them would be really, really proud to be number one. These folks know how to work your system. They know how to get you to do things you don't want to do. And they're good at it. Apparently they made it to number one that year. Yeah. Don't kid yourself. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how to run you all over town. They know how to renegotiate prices because often we back down. They know how to extend terms because again, we back down. Yeah, they know all of these things. So they've been taking advantage of, for, of us for a very, very long time, and we just figured this out today. Don't kid yourself. This group here, they know what they're doing. They're just using your money. Time to change. Talk about raising prices. Number one way to try to fire uh, customers like this, raise prices. <clears throat> yeah. In fact, these folks actually deserve their own pricing matrix. Scumbag pricing matrix. List price, no discount. Yeah, they get their own pricing matrix. But the problem that we just talked about, though, what would probably happen to us if we just raised prices on these folks? The good thing would be they just went elsewhere. The bad thing would be what? They keep buying, but then what's the other consequence? If I were to put one more column on this, what, would, what should I do to help me evaluate the customers? One more call. -off. What other bit of information would I want to help me make a decision here? Yeah. yeah. Days to pay. Yeah. Good information. There is a strong correlation between people who run you all over the place and make it very difficult for you to serve and not paying you for slow pay. Very strong correlation between those two. So if you are squeamish about firing one of these folks or shooting them in the head, add this column and trust me, it gets a little easier. You will find those candidates who you say, it's time. I think it's time for us to part with. Because if we just raised prices and we left the terms exactly the same, what would happen? Our receivables would just blow up. I mean, it's just, you're not doing yourself any favors here. So with this group, if you are going to make drastic decisions and changes, net profit decisions, what do we have to do? Fine. What do we have to do to the terms of this group? That's what we try to do. No credit. Look, our credit is precious. It is a tool. It is a value add that we bring to the chain. They don't deserve it. They have not contributed to that add value service. They don't deserve that. So if you're going to make this decision to raise prices, get rid of the, uh, the credit. Yeah, now who's going to scream here? If I do this, what group of people in your organization are going to scream? Sales. Sales. You bet they're going to scream. Why? It's like, oh man, you're, you're killing me. You're still, you know, you're, you're cutting off my customers here. They're trying to kill all these customers. Because why? These customers have what? There's the P word. What is the P word? Potential. Potential. Yeah, I have the potential to grow. A lot of hair, big mane of hair. Not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Not going to happen with these folks. These folks are not going to raise up to be profitable and have a profitable company. They know what they're doing. This is the way they do business. Don't kid yourself. These folks will never be high profit contributors. 
make the mental decision, and it's tough. Don't, don't give me I know this is tough, because I went through this myself. It is an agonizing process you go through, because there are going to be some names down here that have been doing business with you a very, very long time, especially if you have a multi-generation company. And these could be two and three generations in those relationships. But you gotta make decisions. The people that, you know, that work with you, People that depend on that income in their household, that you are helping them manage, they depend on you to make decisions like that. And they're tough decisions, they're painful decisions. But like all things, the first one's painful, the second one starts to feel a little bit better. So get good at this, you will find your kin. What else could we do to fire some of these people? Or at least change the net profit picture on this group down here. And by the way, I do like to you know, segregate these into groups. I like to name them. So we call it, you know, like the boring distribution world always likes to say ABC customers. I'm so sick of that one. How about gold, silver, bronze? That's another way to do it. Um, I have a client now that uses a star method. You know, one star, two star, three star. Uh, I kind of like the cool guys, okay dude, the scumbags myself, but most of you cannot use that in your organization and get away with it. So what else did we do to change the net profit picture down here? We talked about raising prices, cutting off their credit. You know, salespeople, again, they're gonna cry. Should we call, Should we have our salespeople calling on this group here? Pretty expensive employees to be able, How do we change that behavior? How do we get our salespeople not to call on this group down here? Because trust me, there's gonna be some of their friends here. I guarantee it. They have market rather than sales. Oh, I'm going deeper than this. Okay. Going a little deeper. <clears throat> what do we do? Pay on death row. Nope. Yeah, I'm sorry, what was that over there? Yeah. House accounts. No commission available here. They will, trust me, managing salespeople is not that difficult. You grab them by the wallet and you show them where you want them to go. Quit paying commissions on this and they will change <coughs> their behavior. Yeah, we don't pay commissions on these. These are, these are tougher, tough things to swallow. What else could we do a little bit different? Anything else you might do just a little bit different in this group here? Consolidation. Explain that to me, consolidation. Less, uh, less orders. In this group here? Yeah. yeah, you could tell, you could raise a minimum. If you don't have a minimum <laughs> today, you could say uh, a minimum of $500, you know, $500 orders. In fact, I have a client right now, um, they're a client of yours as well, that has embraced this to the nth degree. And what they said is, they actually broke it up into five groups, but uh, the, top, or the bottom two groups, that if the uh, customer does not place any $250 order, there is a $14 surcharge on that. $14 surcharge? Could you imagine charging that to your customers if they didn't meet the minimum? You're thinking, there's no way. They would dump you, wouldn't they? They would run for the hills. Shocking and amazing. And so pay it. Crazy. So when they pay it, what did he just earn? No problem. What else could we do to change the, uh, uh, the net profit perspective or picture here? How many of you have multiple locations? Okay, so only a couple of you, okay, that's, that's pretty good. For those of you who have multiple locations, uh, there is one word that tends to dominate all operational <coughs> discussions. What would that be? Transfer. Transfer, shouldn't that be a four letter word? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Transfer just kills people with multiple locations and it is so expensive. Yet again, we are so quick and our customer service people is like, oh yeah, I can get it. If I don't have it here, I can get it somewhere else. I can look at my software. Oh, got a little bit over here, got a little bit over there. I'll just transfer it in, I'll have it tomorrow. We do that, don't we? For everybody. Does this group deserve that any longer? No. Again, change the way that we are servicing this set of customers. Our goal is to get them to go elsewhere. We have a finite amount of money that we can spend on customer service, right? It's not like we can go to the company ATM and say, you know what, I need another $10,000. I'm having a little trouble taking care of my best customers. 
We don't have that. We have to reallocate our resources. We're doing business here. We want to do good, more business up here. One of the other scary things, and again, because I'm an inventory geek, um, I have to throw this one out. How many of you have duplications of lines? Multiple lines of suits do the exact same thing. Sometimes I will find entire brands or entire lines of product that just service dogs and bums. Not a great use of our capital, is it? Again, we've got to make different decisions. Look for these little problems that live down here. non stocks cost us a lot of money to buy, to buy out for people. Do they deserve it? No. Thank you all for getting the picture. Change the way that you are servicing or lack of service to this group down here, and they will move elsewhere. Now, if they, now will all of them leave, by the way? I'm going to ask you that. You do all the things I just talked about, and then you just absolutely beat them down as far as you can. Will all of them leave? Will, will these guys leave? Some. Some will, absolutely. But will all of them leave? No. Now, why not? Why will they take that abuse? <laughs> yeah, you're the last uh, you're the last house on the block, and you've been cut off everywhere else, and you're just the last one? Maybe. And ultimately, people will realize that they like doing business with your company, not yeah. because of all the goodies you've been giving them, yeah. but you are pretty darn good at what you do. In fact, you are the best at what you do in your market. You are the best customer service people in your market space. That is why they want to continue doing business with you. And they will take some of these penalties. Will a lot of them leave? Great, go, good riddance. Give them the coupon to somebody else. Go elsewhere. But the ones that stay, on your terms, They'll move up the scale. What about this group here? What should we do a little bit different? What's going on here? What's causing the net uh, to be so negative here? I heard somebody say it over here. Number of orders. Number of orders. Yeah. Yeah. If any of us have very experienced customers that order three times a day, place three or four multiple POs at your place. Yeah. That's expensive. <laughs> Think about the costs we have in terms of, well, we looked at all the, the processing costs, but what has the customer done on their side as well? What kind of costs have they incurred by doing this? <clears throat> their soft costs as well. PO and a payable. Right, right, they generated two things there. Yeah, is that something that a purchasing agent or your customer is going to mentally think about each and every time. No, because it's just not in their wheelhouse. Right. So if we want to change that behavior, if we want to try to consolidate orders like we were talking about earlier, we have to have a discussion at the appropriate level. This is a financial person to financial person discussion. Talking about all the soft costs that they are generating by doing a practice of ordering multiple times a day. It could be an owner-to-owner -owner discussion, but it cannot be a salesperson to purchasing agent or purchasing uh, person discussion. You won't get anywhere. You've got to get it to the appropriate level. That's how you change that level. <coughs> what else could we do here? There's another strategy I like to kind of mess around with there as well. Slightly reframe. There you go. Yeah, slightly raise prices. Why not? When do most of us raise prices? Yeah. When we get an increase from uh, our suppliers, right? Why do we wait until then? It's easy, just. It's easy right? Don't shoot the messenger. Right, right. Oh, no, it's these guys up here. I just got to pass it on. I got to pick my kids. Yeah. You've got a built-in excuse. By the way, that built-in excuse is a great time to raise prices. Just because you get a 10% increase doesn't mean that you can only pass on a 10% increase, right? Is there any laws or rules out there that say that you cannot pass on 10 and a half, 11, 12%? No. We shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, we wait until... Did anybody here just raise prices because it's Wednesday? Mm. Wednesday is price raise day. No, we don't do that, do we? In fact, what if I were to go into your software? 
your pricing matrix, which is frankly the most underutilized feature in many software packages. If I were to go into your pricing matrix and let's just say I hit a multiplier of 1.05, bam, global price increase right across the board. What do you think would happen? I think you're, well, I think that that type of an increase, you know, you're almost at a 5% increase there. I don't want to get in the markup margin discussion, but that's sometimes onerous. That might be, and for many of the, the companies, uh, that 5% bump or that, that multiplier would be a little bit challenged. So you might get some phone calls. Your salespeople might call you. Uh, customers might back away from that. They might change just uh, after the fact. Uh, you might have some pushback with that number. Hey, so, what if I were to go in and hit it with a 1.005 multiplier? Across the board, what do you think would happen then? Nothing. No calls, nothing. You might get one, but it would be very, very rare. So if I did that a couple, three times a year, under the radar, I'd make a little bit more money, good time. Yeah. You've got to learn to raise prices. We're good at what we do. We offer a lot of we offer a lot of value to the chain. We have got to go back and raise prices. Now there's some areas you might get burned, you know, some commodity items. Okay, fine, throw those out of the mix. But raise prices on the less popular things. That's where we're gonna make some money. So if I can take a good hard look, how do I price? In fact, I'm a huge advocate of people getting a pricing guru. Somebody who just works that pricing matrix to death. They manage all costs coming in, pricing, all of that, because most distributors underutilize that function of their software. This group is the one we have to cultivate and cherish. <coughs> Such a small group of people here. We have to show them that we love them. We have to make sure they understand they are our most valuable customer. And sometimes we're not very good at that. We don't tell them on a regular basis how important they are to us. In fact, we barely even identify who they are. So we have to show them. Now, if we were to lose one of these customers, now we've identified them, but one of them decided to go elsewhere, what would we do? Besides crime. What would we do? What would our salespeople do? Try to find a new one. Uh, so try to win them. Uh, yeah, there you go. Try to go get them. And how do we usually do that? <laughs> yeah, anything that works. But where? Yeah. What's our, our? Unfortunately, what we have to wind up doing is we drop our price, don't we? That lasts for a very, very, very long time, doesn't it? Once we have to resort to that, it's going to take us, and frankly, it could knock them into that second tier. The challenge here is to make sure that they never leave you in the first place. That's the goal here. A lot of other things that we want to do here, in fact, if you have sports tickets, or you, know, you want to take people out to lunch, you want to you know, shower them with uh, all the little love trinkets and gifts that you all produce, that's your group right there. This is where we want to spend most of our time. In fact, our outside salespeople should be cultivating this group right here. Salespeople should know them backward and forward. They should profile them dramatically. You're all going to see a little bit on CRM you know, in, the, in the future or later today. This is where we keep this kind of information. You've got to go back and show them. We know who they are and how they do business. Got to use technology to do that. Can't do it on scraps of paper anymore. We never want to leave this relationship up to the salesperson, the one outside salesperson, because they change hands, don't they? Oh, you're up. Make sure that the owner of your organization knows who these people are. <coughs> and I want them to know the first name of the owner of that company, if humanly possible, or at least someone key in that organization. In fact, my younger brother, who still runs our family business, he is charged with meeting every one of these people once a year. Whether it's on the phone, or he plays a lot of golf, he's gotta be, it's gotta show him that they need to know, that, that they are really, really important, because he never wants 
those customers to Google Assistant. Gotta show them your love. Now, there's some other things we can do with this right here. Now that we've figured out who the pinnacle are, what else could we use this group to do? Is it easier to get a new customer or to sell deeper into an existing customer? Or more cost effective, I think is a better way to sell deeper. Sell deeper, absolutely. So that's what I want you all to focus on. How many have heard, uh, let me put it this way. How many people have heard of this assignment? Take all of our customers and uh, let's see uh, what we could be buying them that we aren't, or what we could be selling them that they aren't buying from us today. Ever heard of this assignment? This is a nasty assignment. This is the sales manager's nightmare. This is the nightmare assignment because you bought all these customers and let's go analyze every single one of them and let's see you know, what we could be selling them that they're not buying from us today. And it's such a daunting task that most salespeople, the sales managers, coming from the non-detail oriented uh, world, they just say, I'm not doing that. And, and typically that project kind of falls by the way. Why not do it just with this group up here? Why not try to sell deeper into people that already con uh, contribute positively to your net product there? Go back and analyze them. Find <clears throat> out you know, what categories are they participating in. I did this with a client uh, down in Florida. We went through, he was from a full supply uh, distribution business. We went through and looked at his top customers, <coughs> his, uh, profitability analysis. He had 35 product categories. We found that his top customers participated in less than 10 categories. And I was really generous about participation. Like, if you did 10 bucks in the last year, I said, okay, check the box. You participated. What that showed us is there was this tremendous amount of potential that we had just with this small group of customers. Go back and analyze them. And that's where we need technology to help us do this. Go back and analyze and look for those opportunities here. How we're going to get the win out of this type of an exercise is to really find out what else could we have done here. If you want to expand your business, if you want to find new locations, new product categories to get into, who should we ask? It's amazing what you can achieve by just understanding and extracting data out of your software and analyzing it to make better net profit. Absolutely astounding to me. In fact, it was interesting when I went through uh, the demonstration here with the uh, dynamic CRM. They actually did this inside the demo without any prompting from me. So what's amazing to me is that technology companies are grasping onto this and integrating it with things that you all are already interested in. It's just absolutely fantastic to me. I think the greatest return on any software investment. The ability to extract data and to make meaningful management decisions. You gotta love your A level, A level customers. You gotta show them you love them. You never let them forget. Make some small adjustments to the Bs pricing, numbers of transactions. And trust me, you'll have some fun. <clears throat> go fire some C level customers. Just go shoot them in the head. Get rid of them. We have got to tell people who work with us and for us who they are. Again, this is where I would have to tell is make sure that everybody in the organization knows A, B, and C, and how do we service those customers. Questions for me, thoughts, comments, terror. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do this. Yeah. Any questions about this? Yes, Mike. Correct. Um, what if a C customer is, is uh, strategic to an individual employee? And I uh, can argue that. You mean the brother in law? Yeah. <laughs> you mean the brother in law? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think okay, that's a fair one. That, that could come up. Um, oh, I think in that case, if you really aren't interested in, I mean, most people would like to shoot your brother in law in the head, but uh, if you are not interested in doing that, I think there are some things that you can change, especially around. Some of the bigger ones would be the, uh, the credit terms, you know, working on that. You know, and again, if it's brother-in-law, you know, maybe your your wife can you know take care of that uh, situation. So I, I might do some little changes in there. 
but I would make it painful. The way that we're doing business today is just not acceptable. We can't go forward doing that. Yeah. We, uh, along that line, when we rank our customers, it's you know, going to do it. <coughs> it says that the ability to change the rank. So if they're a B or an A, if they're a C, right. we use A, B, C, D, 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 D. They can make a C, but then they put a B in the end. But they have to have a reading. And that gets reviewed every six months. So the sure. best promise in the live one and come back to that. So you know, we still always see that they're a C, but for some reason, they get a higher. A few exceptions is good. Yeah. Okay. For a period of time, you get <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, a lot of this seems like I'm bashing on salespeople all the time. And I, and I do like it. It's, my, it's a fun sport to do. But <laughs> I think that you're right. The, the salespeople do have to have that discretion. Say, you know, I, I think there's a few of them that, yes, they're ranked here, but I think I can do a little bit. I can change the problem. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I would imagine this would have to be a holistic approach because if you just get rid of the C customers, you're going to lose, while you're, you might not have a net margin on them, they are contributing gross profit dollars to, off, to offset the expenses that you have. And you're yeah. foregoing that GP if you can't replace it in the other clients or with new clients. Correct. No, absolutely correct. I think that's really where I find that threshold of pain. I get down to, and when I look at that group, I mean, I, I'm really probably not going to fire that whole C-level group. I'm really going to look at the ones that have all of the negative boxes checked. You know, the ones that are like, man, you are the worst of the worst of the worst. You don't pay me. You run me all over town. You return everything that I get for you, uh, you know, non-stock. Oh, the worst of the worst, gone. The other ones I probably will try to do a little resurrection if you need possible. So, okay. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And let's take a break, and then uh, Michael is on. Yep. Yeah.